Hi, I'm Vay Topkar. I am Life Sciences, and this is my Blue Sky Proposal. Now, one of uh, the biggest and most horrifying diseases that we see today in the wild in areas like Sub-Saharan and Western Africa is Ebola, which is a viral infection that has a infection pathway that's very similar to HIV. The problem with Ebola is that it's very horrific in nature. You may hear of it colloquially as that one disease that makes you uh, that makes your organs uh, liquefy until you bleed out of every orifice and then die. Obviously, it's a really terrifying disease, and what's even more terrifying is the fact that right now, because there are no direct treatments for the illness, there's a between there's between a 50 and 90 percent chance that you'll die if you get the disease. Obviously, something needs to be done about Ebola, and that's what I uh, kind of try to set out to to solve in my blue side, in my blue sky proposal. So the way that Ebola, uh, in fact, infects a human cell is very similar to how HIV does the same. So you'll see that uh, a, an, an Ebola virus will enter the human, the human body, and then what will happen is that a glycoprotein on its membrane, called GP0, will be hydrolyzed into its two subunits, GP1 and GP2, by a human enzyme, a human protease that's produced by the human, uh, called cathepsin B. Now, cathepsin B will, uh, will hydrolyze GP0 into GP1 and 2, and these two subunits will work together to stabilize the bringing together of the cell and viral membranes, and then uh, essentially um, fuse the membranes together to allow for the propagation of an infection within the human body. And we all know what happens from there. The viral genome will take control of the machinery of the host cell and then produce many, many copies of the, of the Ebola virus, um, which will go on and on in this large cycle of infection within the human body. Now, what has been recently shown within the last five years is that in mice and African green monkeys, as well as a variety of other model organisms, inhibiting cathepsin B actually uh, decreases uh, the infectivity of, new of, of Ebola within an already infected patient, which means that, in essence, if you were to uh, lower the activity of, of cathepsin B in a human being, perhaps we can go about uh, helping treat um, people that are already infected with Ebola. Now, the second big fact that we have already seen within uh, recent literature is the fact that there are two specific drugs, uh, E64D and CA074, that are both uh, that have both um, shown to be very effective and specific inhibitors of cathepsin B in both mice and African green monkeys, which are both very good model organisms for these kinds of, of infections. So uh, obviously both of these two facts come together really well. Perhaps if we can use one of these or both of these drugs um, in humans to inhibit cathepsin B, perhaps we can help treat Ebola uh, infections. Now, the problem is that neither of these two things, individually or together, have been tried in human patients. And that's really what my proposal aims to do. So what I propose in my Blue Sky proposal is a two-phase methodology to figure out if uh, these two drugs will in fact help us treat Ebola in um, patients that are, that are already infected with the disease. So the first phase is figuring out if CaO74 and E64D, these two uh, chemicals, do in fact inhibit cathepsin B activity within human cells. Now the way that we can go about doing this is, using, is by using five different cell lines from, a, from different uh, locations around the body. That way we, we know that we're being more comprehensive in, in assessing the change in activity of cathepsin B. And then what we can do is we can split the cell cultures of, from these cell lines into thirds. The first third will be treated with uh, CaO74, the second will be treated with E64D, and the third with nothing as a control. And after some incubation time, we can figure out, using uh, fluorescent markers, which culture um, has uh, the lowest activity of cathepsin B. And if we do, in fact, see a lower a significantly lower uh, activity of a cathepsin B in the two treated uh, cultures as opposed to the control, we can know in fact that these two drugs do help us uh, lower the activity of cathepsin B in human cells. In the second phase, what we can do is we can see if the data that we got from the first phase in fact will let us uh, um, treat and potentially cure people that already have Ebola um, uh, in the wild. So the way that we do that is very similar to the first phase. We take cell cultures from five different cell lines and we infect them all with a recombinant version of the Ebola virus. This recombinant version will be expressing GFP so that way we know how much of, of a virus there is in a given cell culture. Then for every cell line we take a third of the cell cultures and we uh, treat them with CaO74, the other third we treat with E64D, and the other third we leave 
as a control. And after some incubation time, we can compare the fluorescence of cell cultures between um, different treatments. And if we do see it for either one or both of these drugs that there is a lower fluorescence um, as, as compared to the control, we can in fact see that the decrease in cathepsin B activity that may come from uh, treatment from these two drugs does in fact help us treat uh, Ebola and potentially cure it in the long run. Now, what I think is very powerful about having this kind of two-phase methodology is that even if the second phase doesn't work, if even the first phase works, we actually have a, we will actually have a lot of very powerful data that can be applied to other um, other diseases that aren't just Ebola. For example, let's say we don't get data that supports the notion that these two drugs will in fact help us treat or cure Ebola in already, effect, in already infected patients. What we can actually still do is take the data from the first phase, which will likely be positive, which will likely tell us that um, um, these two drugs do decrease cathepsin B activity in human cells because we've already seen that happen in so many other model organisms. If we take that data and we apply it to other um, uh, to other diseases, um, it can have very, very positive outcomes. And the reason why is because the, the mechanism by which uh, the Ebola virus infects a human cell is analogous to a lot of other viral infection pathways. The HIV infection pathway is very similar. You have this um, glycoprotein that is cleaved into two subunits that then are um, used in conjunction to help the virus become a part of um, the host cell and then uh, continue on with the infection process. This is not unique to Ebola and and, and, and HIV. Rather, it's a very common motif in the way by which a, a variety of viral infections um, get into host cells and create an infection. So if we do in fact show that cathepsin B can be inhibited uh, by these two drugs, even if it doesn't help us treat Ebola, we can still use this inhibition uh, as a outcome of the usage of these two drugs to potentially treat other diseases, other viral infections that may have uh, um, very negative impacts on uh, populations around the world. Now, in terms of when this kind of intervention could be used, obviously right now, areas in which uh, Ebola is, is, is present or, or very active, there is not uh, a very consistent amount of medical care. What we do know is that people who have Ebola either may die very, very quickly or may uh, suffer for a few weeks or a month before they die from the, from the disease. What that means is that there is a period of time during which we can come in and potentially administer these drugs to people who are still in early stages of the Ebola infection infection and potentially uh, help them uh, and help their bodies stop being infected by more and more Ebola virus. If we can, if we can stop at a very early time in infection, the infection of new cells within a host body, that has the potential to allow us to cure or at least manage um, very, very specifically the effects of Ebola within a patient. And that's very powerful because that means we can save a lot of lives and save a lot of suffering. So at the end of LS1A, when I uh, was doing my research for this LS1A um, Blue Sky proposal, what really sounded to me was that uh, a lot of what I ran across in the literature had direct links to what we had learned in class. And there's three main things that I saw um, within the context of my proposal proposal that I really liked and I think that uh, um, uh, LS1A taught me really well. The first thing was talking about um, the HIV infection pathway. Now, uh, perhaps it was just serendipity, but it turns out that the Ebola infection pathway is so similar to HIV that the second I read a paper about how uh, Ebo the Ebola virus infects a human cell, I, I automatically understood what it meant because I'd already learned it in class. You have this glycoprotein that is cleaved into, in, into two subunits that work together to fuse membranes. Um, and I can go into so much more detail about that because of LS1A. But, um, in fact, it's, it's really great because I, I, I knew what was going on um, in the literature without having to um, scour around for a long time as, as I may have otherwise. Uh, the notion of using fluorescence uh, as, as molecular markers to determine the activity of a, of a specific um, protein. In this case, uh, I propose using a, uh, an arginine-arginine um, AMC molecule uh, from Sigma Aldrich that is fluorescent until it's cleaved by cathepsin B, which is a very, very specific enzyme. Uh, and that allows us to um, really powerfully tell uh, the activity or the inactivity of a particular enzyme. Again, something that I learned um, from my experiences in LS1A. And then finally, uh, uh, one technique that I was, uh, that I proposed using in the second phase of my methodology is uh, using a recombinant Ebola virus that expresses GFP to determine just how uh, infectious or just how much infection there is in a given culture of infected um, human cells. Uh, and that technique, again, was taken directly from um, what we learned in LS1A. Um, there's a significant portion of, of our curriculum that talked about how we can use things like recombinant genes um, and, gene, and gene markers to help us track the expression 
of a gene or help us track um, things like infection as I, as I do in my proposal. So all three of these things are, are very, very powerful techniques that we have in biology. They're all very like standard techniques that no matter what literature you read on any topic, you'll see them being used, being thrown around. And I, I'm, very, I'm very grateful for taking LS1A because it let me understand all these things that I, I wouldn't have, I've been able to understand otherwise.